EAA's webinars are made possible through the generous support of Aircraft Spruce and Specialty, serving home builders and EAA members since 1965. Tonight's presentation is titled Outside the Box, and uh, we're going to be talking about the Rotax 912 series engines. Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aircraft Maintenance Management. He's an author for numerous aviation publications, and uh, he holds a certified flight instructor certificate, uh, A&P mechanic certificate, also holds the inspection authorization designation. 2008, Mike was the FAA's Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year, and he's a member of EAA, continuing to volunteer his time to, to talk to us on a monthly basis through the webinar series. Mike, thanks so much for being with us tonight. I'm going to turn control of the presentation over to you. Okay. Um, well, hi, everybody. I um, uh, hope everybody is uh, fully recovered from AirVenture. The, the uh, My presentation uh, uh, tonight, and normally these are on the first Wednesday of each month, but the first Wednesday of August, um, I was uh, just back from AirVenture, and uh, uh, we were all sort of recovering from a total immersion week up there. I gave 11 presentations at AirVenture this year, and uh, so we delayed this one uh, till, the second, uh, till the second Wednesday. It looks like, looks like we have... Um, about 350 people in the room, which is great. We're going to be talking about the uh, the Rotax 912 tonight, and um, I'm going to call on the assistance of uh, my friend Paul Schott during the uh, Q and A because Paul knows a lot about more about these engines than I do. Um, I'm sort of doing this presentation from the perspective of somebody who has a long history with the traditional Continental and Lycoming engines um, and talking about uh, how different the, uh, the Rotax is from, uh, from the, the, the traditional aircraft engines that we, uh, that, that we're used to, you know, in the, in the past 20 or 30 years, there's been just kind of amazing um, technological increases. The pace has been really dizzying the, that the telephone, you know, transferred into, morphed into a cell phone, morphed into these smartphones that really aren't just phones. They're, they're we have our whole lives on them. Um, music has been transformed by technology. Uh, communications, uh, we the, the way we communicate one another is dramatically different. Um, lodging has transformed uh, uh, into uh, things like Airbnb that weren't even thought of a few years ago. Ground transportation, uh, the taxi industry is, um, has, has, has been uh, heavily supplanted by ride sharing and, and, and uh, um, self-driving cars are, are right around the corner, kind of an exciting prospect. And the, this technological revolution has extended to our, to our GA cockpits as well. Um, uh, you know, I, I so well remember the many, many years, decades, really, of of updating big, heavy Jepson binders and and uh, uh, having to carry carry around fifty pounds of of charts in the airplane. And any time when I took a, a, a transcontinental trip nowadays. It's 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 all online. I I have a an iPhone and an iPad in my cockpit, and everything I possibly could need are on those devices. It's just kind of amazing. And while all this this innovation was happening, there was some innovation happening with piston aircraft engines, and it, and it was happening um, in Europe, um, and and very few U.S. aviators really noticed that uh, this company, Rotax, an obscure Austrian subsidiary of a Canadian company, Bombardier, um, who, who was mostly known for little two-cycle engines that were used in snowmobiles and motorbikes and ATVs and, and ultimately on, on ultralights, um, was quietly redefining the, the small four-stroke piston aircraft engine in Europe. When I say small aircraft engine, I'm talking about 
150 horsepower or less engines. Um, and the the history of these small engines is is interesting. The 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 the, the the small aircraft engine kind of a, was originated by by Lycoming and Continental. Um, these are engines back in the days of the J3 Cub and so on. Uh, um, the Lycoming 0145 was, a, I think, a 65 horsepower engine. Eventually, became a 75 horsepower engine. The Continental A40 was a 40 horsepower engine that became a, a 65 horsepower engine. These these engines um, uh, powered um, the, the 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 kind of the ragwing airplanes of the day, and, and and they morphed into the small engines that those companies are are selling today, namely the the Continental O two hundred D, which is uh, kind of a lightweight version of the of the traditional Continental O two hundred that powered the Cessna one hundred and fifty, and so on. And the Lycoming O235, both of these engines are are rated at 100 horsepower. Um, and um, uh, there really hasn't been, I mean, the, these engines, the, the, these Continental and Lycoming engines were pretty much, you know, developed in the 30s and 40s. And they haven't changed a whole heck of a lot um, since then. There have been some small incremental improvements. But these are very, very old engine designs, and um, you know the Rotex 912 is is the first um, major production engine in this class that's come along um, in a long time, and 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 it's striking how different it is in design from the Lycomings and Continentals. Lycomings and Continentals are very, very similar in their design. They're, I often say a Lycoming is a, a continental upside down or vice versa because the Lycomings have their cams up at the top of the crankcase and continentals have them at the bottom. But other than that, the engines use strikingly similar technology. And the Rotax is, is just a very different engine. But most people in the U.S. didn't really notice what was going on with Rotax until 2004 when the FAA approved the LSA rule. And all of a sudden, these sexy factory built uh, SLSAs started showing up um, in the US. And nearly all of them, more than 80% of them, were powered by this engine, this same engine, the Rotax 912. And um, I, I know when this first started happening, um, I, as, as somebody who had, had Grown up in the in the Lycoming and Continental world, you know, kind of said, "Well, you know, who are these guys? Rotax? Aren't those guys that that make the little two-stroke engines on ultralights that sound like uh, uh, what what you get when you cross a mosquito with a chainsaw?" But now, thirteen years later, the the uh, LSA rule has been in effect now for thirteen years. It started. It it was it went into effect in twenty oh four. Everybody's heard of Rotax, and yet the the nature of this engine and how different it is from the Lycomings and Continentals that, that that many of us have grown up with is not fully appreciated. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this engine, from especially from the perspective of 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 how it is different than Lycomings and Continentals, um, the, the some of the innovative approaches that Rotax took that makes this engine have a lot of advantages really over Continentals and Rotex. I, I, I wrote an article about, about this in AOPA pilot. And I said, you know, I wish these guys made a 300 horsepower engine. Cause I'd put one of these things in my Cessna 310 in a, in a minute, if they were available, they, they don't, they, they, they have focused on the, on the low, low end side of the scale, but the, the innovations in this engine are really quite, striking and, and, and quite uh, uh, attractive. So let, let's talk a little bit about the history of how this engine came to be. And then we'll talk a little bit about how the, the engine differs from the Lycomings and Continentals that are dominant in the, in the world of certificated aircraft. Um, the first 912, and, and again, uh, Rotex um, entered aviation in the two-stroke 
world of engines that were really adapted from their you know motorcycle and ATV two-stroke engines, and they were used heavily in 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 ultralights and so on. But the the first 912, which is a four-stroke engine, um, was introduced in 1989. It wasn't certified at that time. Um, so it was an 80 horsepower engine. It had a very short TBO in turn uh, compared to the TBOs that we we're used to in the certificated world. It had a 600 hour TBO and it was largely s sold in Europe for use on large ultralights and motor gliders. Um, in 1994, Rotex finally got the 912 certified. Uh, again, it was an 80 horsepower engine, and by the time they got it certified, they had increased the TBO from 600 hours to 1,200 hours, which was still a little less than the competitive Lycoming and Continental engines, which are both 1,500 to 2,000 hour TBO engines. But um, it, it, you know, a 1,200 hour TBO is a little more like a serious TBO when, when it, in, in the certificated world. I don't think the engine would have been accepted in the certificated world if it had a 600 hour TBO. A um, couple of years later, um, they certified a variant of the 912 called the 912S, which had a um, 100 horsepower rating instead of 80. Uh, again, 1200 hour TBO. And they introduced a turbocharged version of the engine called the 914, which is rated 115 horsepower and had a 1,000 hour TBO. Um, eight years later, the LSA rule was adopted by the FAA and these engines, uh, the demand for these engines skyrocketed as a result. Um, and um, Rotax introduced another variant of the engine called the 912 ULS. The 912 ULS was indistinguishable in every regard from the 912S. It was exactly the same engine, it was exactly the same parts. The only difference was the, the data plate was different, the color of the rocker cover was different, and the main thing is it came with a different packet of paperwork because instead of um, paperwork saying that it was, uh, it was a certified engine, uh, it came with paperwork that said it was, it complied with the, uh, uh, with a consensus standard that uh, that governs uh, um, SLSAs, um, but it was the same engine as 912S. It just had, it had a different set of paperwork with it, different data plate, and actually a different price. The, they they sold the 912 ULS for quite a, quite a bit less than the 912S. Um, I guess the the logic was they spent a lot of money getting the engine certified, and they needed to amortize their investment in certification cost uh, and it built into the price of the 912S, but they didn't do that, didn't build that same cost into the price of the ULS, which was the ultralight version or the, the, the SLSA version. Uh, by this time in 2004, they had increased the TBO from 1200 hours to 1500 hours, which was getting pretty competitive. Um, and then in 2009, they finally increased the TBO on this engine to 2,000 hours. They made some some minor changes to the engine, and uh, if the engine had the the latest and greatest uh, parts in it, it it had a TBO of 2,000 hours. Um, and the next year, the the TBO for the 914 turbocharged engine was increased to 2,000 hours. So now the Rotax had the same TBO as the Continental and Lycoming small engines that, that it competed against. In 2012, they launched, uh, and now all of these engines we talked about so far were carbureted engines. In 2012, they, uh, they, they introduced a fuel injected version of the 912, it's still a 100 horsepower engine, but instead of having uh, dual being carburetors, it, it, it had a fancy um, uh, electronic fuel injection system with a FADEC on it, uh, some pretty bleeding edge technology. And then in 2015, they launched a, a turbocharged version of this injected engine um, with, a, with a horsepower rating of 135 horsepower. Um, 
you know, as I indicated, this engine is definitely not <laughs> a Lycoming or a Continental. It's the, the technology is, is quite different. And the, some of the design thinking was, was really out, outside the box as far as aviation engines were concerned. Um, the, the heritage of Rotax was, was not aviation. And um, a, a lot of the concepts that they came up with in their non-aviation engines were applied to this engine. Um, th there are just striking advantages of the, of the Rotax 912 compared to their Lycoming and Continental competitors. The 912 is smaller, it's much lighter, it's more fuel efficient, it runs on unleaded, unleaded uh, uh, auto gas. Um, to give you an idea how much lighter it is, um, if we compare these these 300 horsepower engines, the, the Lycoming uh, O235C is 240 pounds uh, dry weight, the Continental is 199. The road tax is 132. Um, you know, it's 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 almost half the weight of the Lycoming. It's it's really quite spectacular. How did they do that? How could they make this engine so light? Well, the main reason it's so light is because they turn the engine twice as fast. The crankshaft speed uh, for takeoff on a 912 is 5,800 RPM. A typical cruise RPM is 5,000 RPM. These are crankshaft speeds. Um, and when you turn the crankshaft that fast, um, you can get away with much smaller displacement, much smaller cylinders, because the combustion events are, con are, are occurring twice as often. So each combustion event only has to produce about half the power um, in, in order to, uh, to, to get the, to the horsepower rating you're looking for. Now, of course, you can't turn a prop reasonably at, at, at 1500 rpm because the, the tips would go supersonic so the 912 incorporates a reduction gearbox uh, it's got a, a 2.43 to 1 reduction ratio so on takeoff when the crank is turning at 5800 rpm the prop is is turning at, at, at a 2387 pretty slow prop speed for takeoff compared to what we're used to in the you know direct drive continental light combing world where takeoff rpms are typically between 26 and 2800 rpm and it crews uh, with a 5000 rpm crankshaft speed the prop is turning at, at uh, about 2060 2060 rpm well, again a, 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 a very low rpm setting in compared to what we're used to in the light combing continental world which makes for a nice quiet cruise um, the, the, um, as we'll see a little later, the, the, the tack in the cockpit in a Rotex installation is measuring cranks, crankshaft speed, not propeller speed. So we, you know, we will always talk about things like 5,800 RPM and 5,000 RPM, uh, because the tack is referenced to, to how fast the crankshaft is turning, not how fast the prop is turning. Now, having a geared engine is a little bit scary if you're if if you come from the the traditional Lycoming and Continental world. The the uh, uh, traditionally geared Lycomings and geared Continentals are, first of all, are big bruisers of engines, but they uh, the, the the gearbox makes tends to make them have pretty low TBOs and very very expensive overhaul costs. Um, as it turns out, the uh, the gearbox in the Rotax has uh, is is small. It's light. I mean, the the weight of the engine is amazingly light, and it's proven to be highly reliable and doesn't doesn't require any special maintenance other than a recommended thousand hour inspection. And that's a that's not a, a disassembly inspection. It's a it's it's a pretty routine inspection. Now, to get that much horsepower from such tiny cylinders at such high RPM um, creates something of a, of a challenge um, in terms of cooling the cylinders. And Rotax deals with this in, a, in, in an interesting way um, by com combining the, the normal air cooling of cylinder barrels that we're kind of used to with Lycoming's Continentals, so air, air passing over fins on the cylinder barrels with liquid cooling of the heads so that there's it's it's really a a a hybrid cooling system 
air cooling of the barrels and liquid cooling of the heads. Um, the engine incorporates a, a small internal coolant pump and a small external coolant radiator. Um, the coolant volume of this engine, because we're only, we're only cooling the heads, um, is only about a half a gallon. So the cooling, the liquid cooling system doesn't really add a lot of weight to the engine. And uh, having liquid cooled cylinder heads produces much cooler cylinder head temperatures than what we are accustomed to if we're used to running Lycomings and Continentals, where typically we're talking about, you know, CHTs up around 400 degrees Fahrenheit. In the, uh, in the case of the Rotax, the red line is 275, and the typical CHTs and crews are around 200 degrees. Um, this is sort of a schematic diagram of the of the cooling system, the, the if you do a pre-flight on a, a Rotax, you and you open up the, the cowl, you'll see that there's a uh, there's a coolant reservoir there, and that's one of the things that we have to check uh, during pre-flight. Um, the electrical system on this engine is is also novel. The 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 engine was designed with electronic ignition system as standard equipment. And in order to have electronic ignition system, you have to have a real bulletproof electrical system because if the electrical system goes away, the engine quits. So um, Rotax designed the, the 912 with dual alternators built right inside the engine. These aren't external alternators the way we're kind of used to that bolt on from the outside or are driven by a belt or something. These are alternators that are actually an integral part of the engine built right into the engine. The, the, the engine has a, a flywheel that, uh, that that incorporates a, a strong permanent magnet and a set of stator coils inside the crankcase um, that uh, are excited by this rotating magnetic flywheel and generate um, um, AC volts, which which then are rectified and regulated by an external uh, assembly. So it's essentially built right into the engine is a dual alternator system that uh, that powers the electronic ignition system and so on. Um, also, the AC that comes from the alternators uh, that also drives the, the tachometer uh, mounted on the panel, uh, which is why it displays crankshaft speed, not propeller speed. The lubrication system of this engine is in some ways similar to the Lycoming and or, or to the Continental O200, which is a dry sump system, as opposed to the Lycoming engines and the bigger Lycoming Continentals we're used to that are a wet sump system with an oil pan at the bottom of the engine. In the case of the Rotax, um, the, the, the oil um, is, is kept in a tank that's remotely located from the engine. Um, and, and it's called that's called a dry sump system. Now, in the Continental O200, the tank is mounted below the engine and relies on gravity to um, to get the oil from the the crankcase into the oil tank. In the case of the Rotax, uh, the oil tank is typically remote mounted on the firewall, as you can see in this picture. And so instead of um, using gravity the, uh, or using a separate scavenge pump, the Rotex uses internal crankcase pressure um, that, that that's, uh, occurs in all piston engines from low bypass to compression rings because since the rings don't seal the combustion chamber perfectly, there's always pressure uh, combustion uh, gas pressure that blows by the rings and pressurizes the crankcase. In Continental and Lycoming engine, pressurized oil in the crankcase tends to throw oil mist out the breather, and that's a big part of the oil consumption of those engines and, uh, and the oil in the belly syndrome that we're kind of used to. In the case of the Rotax, they actually take advantage of this, uh, of this crankcase pressure. Um, to force the oil from the bottom of the crankcase into the remote mounted oil tank. Um, one peculiar aspect of the, of, of, of the Rotax engine, since they use this interesting uh, blow-by propelled oil recovery system, if you will, 
is that um, during pre-flight, when you uh, when you, you check the dipstick in the oil tank to check the oil level, you have to make sure that all of the oil that, that's in the bottom of the crankcase gets transferred in, into the tank before in order to get an accurate reading. And that's done by a procedure called burping the engine, where you turn the prop over by hand, um, creating um, this crank crankcase pressure as you're doing that. And, um, um, and, and once you start hearing um, gurgling in the, uh, in the oil tank, you know that all the oil has been transferred to the tank and now you're just, you're just transferring air. And at this point, you can take a dipstick reading and get an accurate reading. Um, the Rotex 9-2L was designed from the get-go to run on unleaded um, auto fuel. Uh, premium auto gas. Like, I think I think the minimum uh, octane requirement is 90 octane. I don't have it in front of me, but it's something like that. Um, the engine can run on 100 low lead if necessary, and and at the moment, you know, there are a lot of airports where that's the only um, aviation gasoline that you can buy. Um, but operation on 100 low lead, while permitted, is not particularly recommended. Um, because lead is a, the, the, the tetraethyl lead in leaded avgas is a significant contaminant. And in fact, Rotex draws a line and says if, if an engine is, if their engine is, if 912 is operated on 100 low lead more than 30% of the time, then a number of, of, of extra provisions kick in. The, the oil and filter change interval are reduced in order to, to, the oil needs to be drained more often to get rid of the, the lead accumulation. Um, various preventive maintenance, um, uh, scheduled preventive maintenance tasks are, are more frequent if you're running on 100 low lead more than 30% of the time. Uh, the use of all synthetic oil, like Mobile, uh, Mobile One, is not allowed if you're using um, lead adapt gas because synthetic oil, which is superior in every other way to petroleum-based oils, it's one Achilles heel is that it can't it can't hold lead salts in suspension. And so if you are running an engine on synthetic oil and it's using leaded fuel, you wind up getting um, a buildup of lead sludge that can really mess things up inside the engine. As witness all the lawsuits that we had back in the 90s when mobile AV-1 was on the market and all synthetic oil that was used in piston aircraft engines used that were run on leaded avgas and it caused all sorts of problems and ultimately was pulled off the market. So Rotex um, recommends the use of all synthetic oil if you're running on unleaded fuel, but if you're running um, mostly on on uh, leaded avgas, they say don't don't use all synthetic oil, which is Good, good advice from my my experience. And, and they warn that if you're using um, leaded fuel, that that sludge may build up in the oil tank and in the gearbox and uh, may may um, may cause maintenance problems down the road. Um, So those are, that's sort of some of the highlights of the things that make this engine different. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit, bit about the operational considerations from a pilot standpoint. Uh, operating the Rotax is straightforward, but it has some peculiarities that make it a little different than, than, than uh, operating a Lycoming or Continental engine. We already mentioned that uh, the, one of them, which is that uh, during pre-flight, you need to burp the engine by rotating the prop until you start to hear gurgling in the oil tank before you check the dipstick. Otherwise, the reading on the dipstick may be low or lower than it should be. Um, you need to check the coolant level during pre-flight. Of course, we don't have to do that on Continental's Lycoming because there isn't any coolant. Um, the main coolant tank should be full or should be some coolant in the, over, in the overflow tank, and we always want to check the engine for coolant leaks during the pre-flight visual inspection just as we check all engines for fuel and oil leaks. Um, the starting procedure uh, on the uh, Rotax is a little bit different. 
uh, carbureted uh, 912s uh, prior to the, the IS versions um, have a choke, but not a primer. In, in Lycoming Continental World, we're used to having a primer, but not a choke. Um, so that's one difference. Also, the, the 912s uh, have no mixture control. Uh, laning is automatic. Uh, the carbureted versions, the, the, the carburetor, um, it includes automatic leaning provisions and in the injected versions that there's complex software to that, that automatically leaves the engine. So we don't have a mixture control in, in any of the 912 family. Um, the normal cold starting procedure in this engine, uh, again, is a little bit different than what we're used to in Lycoming's and Continental. So you'd start out with the, with the throttle retarded to idle, activate the choke, turn on the electric fuel pump, and then crank the engine. Um, there's a 10 second maximum limitation. If it doesn't start within 10 seconds, which it normally does, then you're supposed to rest the starter for a little while and then and then attempt to crank it again. Once the engine starts, um, we retard the choke slowly and simultaneously advance the throttle. Um, and uh, uh, once things are running smoothly, we, we maintain an idle speed of 2,000 RPM crankshaft speed, which is, um, I don't know, but 800 and something propeller RPM. Um, warm up the engine for a minute or two, and then advance the throttle to 2,500 RPM for taxi. Um, we want the oil temperature to rise to 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 centigrade before taxiing. Um, when we get to the run-up area, we run up the engine at 4,000 RPM. Again, that's crankshaft speed. So that's um, you know a little less than 2,000 RPM propeller speed. And uh, the mag check drop is a maximum of 300 RPM. Uh, it seems high, but, but again, we're measuring crankshaft RPM, not uh, propeller RPM. And the maximum differential um, between the, the the left and right ignition systems, I, I say mag check, but it's not really mag. It's an electronic system. Uh, the maximum difference between the two systems um, is 120 RPM. And then after run up, we retard the throttle back to a 2,000 RPM idle. Um, at takeoff, um, the RPM red line is 5,800 RPM. The engine is rated to run at 5,800 RPM for maximum five minutes, and then 5,500 RPM continuous after that. Normal cruise is, is around 5,000 RPM, plus or minus 100, and we don't have to worry about leaning because mixture control is automatic. Um, there are a bunch of, of temperature um, benchmarks that we have to observe. Normal CHTs are uh, 175 to 195 Fahrenheit or 80 to 90 Celsius, very, very cool compared to what we're used to with Lycomis and Continentals because the cylinder heads are, are liquid cool. And the maximum CHT is 275 degrees Fahrenheit or 135 Celsius. Um, if the maximum CHT is exceeded, um, and conventional coolant is used, which is a water type coolant, we, 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 we get concerned about uh, the, the, the coolant starting to boil, which would be a bad situation. So that CHT is pretty, red line is pretty important, but it, you normally don't get there. There is, um, uh, Rotex also allows for the use of, of waterless coolant, which has a much higher boiling point. Um, it's, it, 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 it doesn't have as good transfer characteristics, so it doesn't cool as well, but it, but the boiling point is very, very high. Um, oil temperature normally runs, you know, right around 200 degrees plus or minus with uh, Fahrenheit, which is pretty much what we're used to in like and Continentals. And standard oil pressure is um, about 60 PSI or... Uh, if in aircraft where uh, metric uh, instrumentation is installed, it's it's four bar. Um, after landing, 
and, and I, I gave I, I gave the the, the, the metric measurements, measurements be, and Celsius, Celsius measurements because a lot of these aircraft, um, the Rotax aircraft are manufactured in Europe and and come with uh, instruments uh, that are calibrated in in Celsius and in metric. After, After landing, landing um, it's good, good form to allow the engine to cool down at idle RPM for a little bit before we shut it down, um, because as soon as we shut down the engine, the coolant um, circulation stops. So in the same way that we traditionally are used to doing a, a, a bit of a cool down for turbocharged engines, um, the, the Rotax also, it's a good idea to let the engine run at idle for a little bit before you're shutting it down uh, in order to keep the coolant circulating and allow the cylinder head temperatures to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, to come down. And we shut down the engine with the ignition switch because there is no mixture control. So that's, uh, that's something that's a little different um, from what we're used to in, in, uh, in continental light combing engines where we shut it off by pulling the mixture to idle cut off. We, we can't do that in a, in a Rotex, so we shut off the engine using the ignition switch. Um, when I was at Sebring, I guess it was two years ago, um, I, I had a, a, a conversation about these engines with uh, Phil Lockwood of Lockwood Aviation in, in Sebring, who is the preeminent uh, provider of parts and the, 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 the biggest Rotax overhaul shop in the country and a company that, that does uh, the, the lion's share of maintenance training for maintenance technicians on the Rotax engines. So, so he's basically considered to be the, the Rotax guru. And um, um, I was talking to him about the, the, the whole issue of TBOs on these engines and um, how they, what they did to the engine to bring the TBO up to 2,000 hours and so on. And um, Phil was telling me that when these engines come in after 2,000 hours for overhaul, um, it's absolutely astonishing um, how little wear uh, they show after 2,000 hours. The, he, he said, with the exception of the, the, the valves and valve guides, which tend to be pretty worn, um, all of the rest of the 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 the, the engine parts, the the, the the pistons and cylinders and bearings and so on, um, are are almost indistinguishable from new and clearly could could go a, a lot longer than than two thousand hours if 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 they needed to. It seems like the from what Phil was telling me, the the valve train, particularly the exhaust valves, are are, are kind of the the limiting factor here, but the, the, these engines have um, um, have have had incremental improvements over the years since they were introduced in what 1989, um, and have proven to be very very reliable um, low maintenance power plants. And um, there's, there's an awful lot to like about these engines. As I said, I I, I would love to see Rotex build. Bigger, bigger engines uh, that, that could go into into larger aircraft, aircraft like the one I fly, but, but at the moment uh, they're they're focused on on these under under 150 horsepower engines. But these are really quite interesting engines. So um, that's about all I have as far as prepared material. And um, uh, Tim is 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 Paul available to help me out on Q and A? I am right here, Mike. It's really nice to see you. And oh, I'm excellent. Happy okay. to help. Uh, by good. the way, Mike, I must, I must commend you at this point. For a guy who spends his whole life flying behind a pair of Continental engines, you've done a wonderful job bringing yourself into the 21st century. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I try to be a 21st century guy in the 19th century world. but. Uh... <laughs> All right, gentlemen, we've got a lot of questions that have come in, so let's jump right into them here. First one from William. Um, speaking of auto gas for the 912, which in the U.S. is very hard to find at U.S. airports, why didn't the Rotex uh, make 100 low lead the prime fuel for this engine? Well, um, I mean, I, I, if I have to answer that question, I would say be, because 
uh, uh, first of all, 100 low lead is, 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 is clearly going away at some point. Second of all, unloaded mow gas is, 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 uh, is, is less expensive and at least on a worldwide basis, much, much more available. Um, and third of all, lead is horrible stuff. You know, if, if, if you can design an engine that doesn't require leaded fuel, um, that's a that's tremendous, tremendous advantage. advantage. Um, it, it, it's the, to a large extent, it's, it's the lead in 100 low lead that causes us to have to change oil as, and filters as often as we do that, that creates buildup, uh, you know, on exhaust valves and piston crowns and, um, generates lead sludge in, in, in nasty places in our engines. It's, it's, you know, lead is, is not nice stuff. And uh, it just, it, it, to me, uh, the fact that these engines will, will run right out of the box on unleaded fuel and really prefer to run on unleaded fuel is a big advantage. Um, I, you know, we certainly, we do have a, a very transient problem with the fact that mobile gas is, is not widely available at a lot of airports, but uh, again, the, I think the Rotax was developed more for the future than it was for the past, and it's probably time for the airports to catch up with the technology. Mike, may I chime in here? Absolutely. Uh, Paul here. My perspective on this is very simple. Yes, lead is terrible stuff, but all of the problems with lead can be mitigated through some slight additional maintenance procedures. Now, if I could have been using... Uh, unleaded 91 octane auto fuel for these last seven years of my flight school, I would have been doing so because it's obviously a better fuel in many respects. The problem is in my state, our state legislature in its infinite wisdom has mandated that no auto fuel can be stole, sold in my state that does not contain ethanol. Now, now, ethanol, ethanol is a solvent. solvent. It, likes it likes to dissolve, dissolve things like, like airframe, airframe parts, parts and engine parts, parts and fuel system parts and uh, filters and uh, O-rings and hoses. Uh, as bad as lead can be for engines, alcohol in your engine is terrible. And alcohol in your airframe may be prohibited depending upon the construction of your airframe. So for me, it was a very simple trade-off. Is there um, a, a, a maximum ethanol percentage that Rotex allows? Yes, Rotex will allow 10% ethanol. Even at 10%, my airframe does not allow any ethanol, and that's true of many airframes, especially those with wet wings. When your wing is the skins of the metal wing, when, when your fuel tank is the skins of the metal wing, and the edges of those metal sections are held together with a solvent, with a an epoxy uh, uh, adhesive, and, and ethanol, ethanol melts, melts that epoxy adhesive, what you, what you have, have is, is weeping, weeping wings. And I only like that if I'm de-icing. So, so some of us have no choice but to use under low lead if we can't get ethanol-free MOGAS. From my perspective, I don't mind the extra maintenance tasks, and it's far better than dealing with the evils of ethanol. The, the, the ethanol mandate is a state mandate and not a federal one, I take it. Yes, yes, it is. And our legislature has thrown a bone to the corn industry, I think. But that's my personal opinion. I do not speak for the politics of my state. Yeah, yeah okay. Question, Question from Phil, Phil here. He's saying to burp the Rotax, we are told to rotate the propeller several times. With well over 50 years of Lycoming and Continental engine exposure, I was taught to be very careful when pulling the engine through by the propeller. Now, now we, we pull the Rotax, Rotax through without being careful. careful. What's, What's up, up with that? that? Well, first, well, first of all, we're very careful when you pull the Rotax through. We're, we're very careful that, that the key is in our hand and the ignition <laughs> is cold. Okay, okay but and, and let me just add to that. The, 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 the caution about pulling the propeller through on continents and light combings is because most of those use a magneto ignition system with impulse couplings. And, and the, the only thing, thing preventing, preventing the spark plugs, plugs from firing is is, is a, 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 a a ground a grounded p lead, lead. And, and if that p lead, lead is is broken or something you have a, a hot magneto so the the the, the, the likelihood of of of, of, a, of, a, of a magneto ignition system engine starting inadvertently when the prop is pulled through 
is vastly higher than the probability of a, of a road tax with an, its electronic ignition uh, starting when you're pulling the propeller through. It's a much, the, the, the protection is much more robust, I think. Um, it, it, it does not require turning the key to on to have a danger when you're, when, when you're dealing with magneto ignition engines because the magneto wants to fire and the only thing preventing it from doing so is, is is, is one wire, wire that is grounding the magneto out, out and if something happens to that wire and and, and P -leads, these P leads are notorious for for, for fatigue fracturing in service, service uh, then you have a hot mag. So I, I think uh, the, the, the the danger uh, with a magneto ignition engine is much much higher than the danger of uh, of an engine with an electronic ignition firing inadvertently. Well, well said, said, Mike. Another, another word of caution, caution however, when you're pulling the Rotax engine through to burp the engine, please be sure that you pull through in the direction of normal engine rotation only. And that's because when you're turning the prop, you're turning the gears in the gearbox, and that means you're also turning the camshaft, which is turning the oil pump. And when you turn the oil pump frontwards in the proper direction, you're pumping oil onto the bearings. When you, when you turn, turn the prop through, through backwards, you're pumping air onto the bearings and drying them out, them out. and, and the engines, engines don't like that. that. Okay, okay, next one here from Keith. Keith's, Keith's wondering, do the Rotex engines use imperial or metric hardware throughout? All metric hardware, M4s and M6s and M8s, and the torque specs are all metric as well. This is all covered in the maintenance manual, and anybody working on a Rotax engine ought to have a set of metric torque wrenches. And we had a follow-up yeah, question. Um, go, ahead. go ahead, Tim. Okay, we just, we just had a follow-up to that then also. I, I don't have the person's name, but they were wondering, do the maintenance manuals give the um, different specifications and torques and things like that in only metric or also uh, imperial? Well, the, fortunately, the newer maintenance manuals, the newest editions, have both units present. Yeah, yeah I, I, I wanted to comment that this isn't directly responsive to the question, but um, Rotex has has created a, a, a very, very thorough set of training courses for maintenance technicians who work on these engines. There's three different levels of training that, that, that you can take from preventive maintenance all the way all, all the way up to overhaul. Um, and the, 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 the Rotex documentation actually makes a statement that no one who had no technician who has not gone through Rotax training is allowed to do maintenance on a Rotax engine. Now, this was a question that was called um, by by somebody who wrote a letter uh, to the um, FAA Office of General Counsel and said, can they really do that? And, and the, the FAA, FAA Office of General Counsel issued a letter of interpretation saying, no, they can't. They, they said that wrote, no, no manufacturer can, can create requirements for who is qualified to work on their products. Only the FAA can, can, uh, can set those requirements. So although the manuals say only somebody who's gone through Rotax school is allowed to work on a Rotax, in, in fact, um, the, the FAA has ruled that that, that any A and P can work on a Rotex. That, that may or may not be a good thing, thing but it's, I, thought I thought it was worth mentioning. mentioning. Mike, I think that letter of interpretation was a great thing, because this means that any A and P is now legally authorized to screw up a Rotex, a Rotex engine as badly as he or she wishes. Wishes, which, since I run a Rotex independent uh, repair station at the heavy maintenance manual, this gives me lots of business. So I think that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Uh, uh, you were behind this, I see. You probably wrote that letter, right? Uh, you know what, guys? Well, I bet we have a lot of AMPs listening tonight who are kind of getting themselves educated on 912, so this is a good thing, I think. Well, the ones who are here I, I, or are going to watch this uh, uh, webinar on instant replay uh, are definitely the ones who are going to be qualified and competent with Rotax engines. With regard to those maintenance courses, though, Rotax offers four different maintenance course levels. Uh, I personally have taken seven of them because I'm a slow learner. Seven of the four? 
That is, that is correct. correct. Okay. <laughs> I've retaken a few of them. Hey, uh, Walt is wondering, uh, can the Rotex 912, 912 914 engines utilize a constant speed prop, or is it only fixed pitch? They, they do um, have an yeah, adapter. They, do. they have an adapter that allows them to drive a constant speed prop. Unfortunately, the light sport rules in the United States say that you cannot use a constant speed prop on an LSA. But if you're flying an experimental amateur built aircraft, then of course, a lot of people are putting constant speed props on them. Okay, and uh, Paul is wondering is internal corrosion an issue as it is on Lycomings and Continentals that haven't been flown very often? Mike, you want to take that? You're big on borescopes. Well, I'm sure I'm 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 sure the internal corrosion is uh, a problem just as it is with with Lycomings and Continentals. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, Airplanes, airplanes and airplane engines like to fly, to fly and they don't like to sit, sit. and the, the, that's, that's just, just the way it is. And, and at, at least, least in my, my world, the biggest, biggest the biggest single cause of engines failing, failing to make TBO is because of, uh, of, of corrosion issues due to inadequate, I mean, I mean to, to excessive uh, uh, periods, periods of disuse, uh, um, particularly for aircraft, for aircraft that, that live in areas of high corrosion, corrosion risk, like, like you, know, you know, the Gulf, Gulf states, states and that, that sort of thing. And, and Jack's wondering, is the external voltage regulator rectifier heat, heat sensitive, sensitive i.e. are there special installations um, required to keep it cool? Oh, yes, it has uh, fins, uh, heat sink fins, and it has to be installed to the firewall with heat transfer compound between the block and the firewall itself, and that gives you significant improvement in cooling. I've had to replace a couple of them that were not properly mounted. Well, I have a related question for you, Paul. The, the, um, in, 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 in Rotax powered aircraft, obviously this internal dual alternator system is required to, to power the ignition system and so on. But is, 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 is there typically an external alternator that powers the, the aircraft, the airframe's electrical system? Mike, I'm glad you asked that because you mentioned the dual alternator system on the Rotax engine. Actually, it's a triple alternator system built into the flywheel. You have one pair of coils that drive ignition module A, a second pair of coils that drive ignition module B, and a third pair of coils that produce AC that goes to a separate regulator, a rectifier for the power bus of the aircraft. In addition, many aircraft do have an external auxiliary alternator as well. Both of the planes that I fly do. And the reason is very simple. The internal alternator system, the windings that actually drive the power bus, produce only 15 amps at 14 volts. The, the external, external auxiliary, auxiliary alternator, alternator I have gives me another 20 amps, amps which allows me to fire up an awful lot of avionics. And, and is the external, external alternator uh, belt-driven or gear-driven? How, how is it how is it driven off the engine? It's, it's driven off an accessory housing on the rear of the gearbox, so it is gear-driven. Uh -huh. Walt is wondering, is there any disadvantage to a high RPM engine driving a propeller through a gear reduction versus a direct drive? The main advantage of direct drive engines is that they're very simple and very reliable. You have a crankshaft that's spinning around, being pushed around by pistons and their rods. And on the front of this crankshaft, there is a flange. On the front of the flange, we bolt a stick. And, and every, every time, time the crankshaft goes around once, the stick goes around once, around without, once without any effort at all. It's very simple and very reliable. That's, That's the advantage of direct drive. drive. But, the but the drawback is engines typically produce optimum torque at high RPM. Propellers, propellers always produce optimum thrust at low RPM. RPM. So when so you bolt the stick onto the flange onto the crankshaft, either the crankshaft is turning too fast or the prop is rather too slowly, or the prop is turning too fast, or both. So the advantage of the geared engine is that the engine is turning all day long at 5,000 RPM, which is its torque sweet spot. 
Well, the, well, the propeller is turning all day long at 2,000 RPM, which is a sweet spot for thrust. But there is a drawback, and that's the 10-pound gearbox sitting right on the nose of your airplane, pulling your CG forward. And of course, that means that the airframe designer has to find a way to compensate for that in the uh, hanging of the engine on the aircraft to pull the CG back into a reasonable envelope. But, 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 but even, even with that 10-pound gearbox, gearbox, the 912 is, is 70 or 80 pounds lighter than the, its direct, direct drive competitor. So I found that kind of interesting. Well, that's great. The only point I wanted to make is the gearbox is one of the heavier portions of that 130-pound engine. And it's all the way at the front, at the nose, about as far forward as you can get. So it does have, to, it does have an impact upon distribution of mass. And, and Paul, Paul, you're not aware of any history of, 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 of gearbox failures or anything, right? They're pretty damn reliable. They are, but on two occasions, I have had to replace gear sets in my gearboxes at mid-time. Uh, this is not terribly expensive. It's a minor inconvenience at best. But I have had a couple of instances running a couple of engines on leaded avgas that the gearboxes had sludged up enough that the gear set had to be replaced. Now, there are two gears. There is the large main gear, uh, which uh, is driven by a small drive gear off the end of the crankshaft. And the gears are sold as a pair, as a matched set by serial number. So if you have to replace one of the two gears, you have to replace them both. It is, uh, uh, I think, I think it was around eighteen hundred dollars for the gear set. Last couple of times I did it. And what are, what are what are the rejection criteria? This this is something that what came up at the thousand hour inspection. Right. Right. I don't even do my own gearbox inspections personally because you you mentioned the folks at Lockwood Aviation and Sebring. They are experts on Rotax gearboxes, and they've got a guy sitting on the bench forty hours a week doing nothing but gearbox inspections. So I pull a gearbox off one of my planes, uh, usually on a Sunday afternoon after my last lesson that day. I box it up overnight. Monday morning, I next day UPS air freight it to Sebring. They get, they get the, the, the gearbox on Tuesday. Tuesday. They do a one-day turnaround on the inspection of the gearbox, including, by the way, the new gear set if necessary. And then they ship it back to me UPS Air the next day. So by Thursday, my plane's back in the air. This is a revenue-producing airplane, so downtime would be uh, obviously disruptive. Mm -hmm. um, Donald's wondering, is the high idle speed to prevent harmonic gearbox chatter? The main reason for the 2,000 RPM idle speed, of course, is to warm up the oil before flight. But that's just the speed I set idle for during a warm-up of the engine. The actual idle speed I set for the, for the engine throttle all the way closed is around between 1,700 and 1,800 RPM. And slower than that, you can get some clashing of the gears, and it can actually wear out the gearboxes faster. So, so it sounds like uh, there is a sweet spot for idle speed to minimize wear in the gearbox. Absolutely, and that's between 1,700 and 1,800 crankshaft RPM. Ray's wondering, uh, any thoughts on the use of lead scavenging additives like Decalon when 100 low lead is the only fuel option? It says Rotax is noncommittal. There are two... Uh, fuel, fuel additives, additives that Rotax will approve. They both use trichloroplastophosphate, uh, and I've had mixed results with them. Trichloroplastophosphate, rather. Trichloroplastophosphate, which is sold either under the, under the brand name Decalin or the brand name TCP. Either one of them will scavenge the lead and put it into suspension so that it gets blown out the exhaust pipe. And that's a good thing. And my experience is that it does reduce the oil residue left in the gearbox and also in the oil tank. The downside of that is, depending upon the kind of exhaust system you're using on your aircraft, if you, if you have, have that lead vaporized, vaporized being blown off the exhaust, exhaust system, that, va that va those, those lead vapors hit the cold tin of your exhaust, your exhaust and, they and they are going, going to condense. condense. They're going to solidify and eventually solder coat the inside, inside of your exhaust system. system. And this, and this of, course, of course, leads to cracks in the exhaust system and shortens the life of the, 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 the tailpipe and the uh, uh, exhaust pipes and the muffler. So it's a trade-off between lead in the engine and buying a new exhaust system every so many years.
Nicholas is wondering, what's your opinion on the numerous hoses and fittings required versus other engines? Are they a weak point? They could be if you just run the rubber on condition. You see, you've got rubber coolant hoses, and you've got rubber fuel hoses, and you've got rubber oil hoses, and rubber will eventually disintegrate from either the fuel or the oil or the heat or the coolant in them. So if you run them on condition, the challenge is you can't see the condition inside the hose unless you take it off. And if you're going to take it off, you might as well replace it. Rotax engineers figured out that these hoses should last about 10 years. So they have a mandatory replacement interval of all the rubber hoses once every five years as a precaution. If you comply with the Rotax mandated five-year rubber replacement, I have never then seen a hose fail in flight. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, I have a question about about that. Uh, obviously, I, I fly a, a turbocharged twin that has a lot of uh, flexible, flammable fluid hoses. And um, on my airplane, I insist on using nothing but, but Teflon hoses, which have a much longer life than rubber hoses. Are Teflon hoses uh, available or an option for, for the use on the flexible hoses for the Rotax? Rotax has gone to Teflon hoses on their fuel hoses on the injected engine and some of the newer carbureted engines, uh, and that is a good thing. They have not approved Teflon, however, for the coolant hoses or the oil hoses yet. Mm -hmm. Tyler's wondering, what type of oil do you use to break the engine in when it's new? Oh, gee, may I take that one? Uh, Mike, do you mind? Uh, this is a uh, this is a, a pleasure for me to discuss. It take, may take a little while, and if we're time limited, let me direct you to a webinar I did a few years ago titled "Care and Feeding of the Rotax 912." You can find it on ea.org/webinars, and in that webinar, I discussed the options for oils. I'll give you the short answer right now. Uh, oil oil could be composed of one of three materials. It could be pure petroleum. Like, like the ones, ones that they discovered in Titusville, Pennsylvania, the first oil, oil, oil uh, wells in this country. Uh, the, company the company Pennzoil is noted for that discovery. Uh, you, uh, you can use uh, uh, synthetic oils, oils like Mobile One, one as long as you're not running leaded fuel. fuel. Or you, you can use a blended fuel, a semi-synthetic that has some petroleum in it and some synthetic compounds. Any of, Any of the three are acceptable to Rotax, but they, but they do specify that if you are running uh, leaded fuel, you must not use the pure synthetic. So you can use semi-synthetic blended oil or pure petroleum. We operate an aircraft engine over a wide range of temperatures, so we need to have oil that is compatible with a wide range, wide operating temperature range, which means variable viscosity oil is mandated. Uh, over the, Over the temperature ranges that I operate, because I operate in Pennsylvania, where we're cold in the winter and hot in the summer, we operate a multi-grade oil, which is 10W40. We also have, an, have to have an oil that does not have the normal anti-friction compounds that you find in Continental and Lycoming engines when they run Aeroshell or Phillips or some of the other aviation oils. Because, because the anti-friction compound will cause an interesting problem in the gearbox. You see, you see, the, the gearbox, gearbox is lubricated, is lubricated by, by the same oil as the engine oil. oil. And, and there is an overload clutch, a slipper clutch in the gearbox. And can you imagine what would happen to a clutch running in an oil bath that has anti-friction compounds in it? The clutch will start slipping. So you can't use your standard Aeroshell aviation oil or Phillips aviation oil in these engines. Uh, in addition, since we have a wet clutch in a gearbox lubricated by engine oil, we want, we want to, to do something, something to protect the gears. The gears. Motorcycles have the same issue. Most, Most motorcycle, motorcycle engines run a wet clutch in a gearbox gear lubricated by engine oil. oil. So, the so the companies that provide lubricants for motorcycles have come out with motorcycle oil compounds that have anti, uh, that have gear protective uh, additives in addition to uh, the proper viscosity range. And I, and I did, for quite, for quite a while, while run uh, motorcycle, motorcycle oil in my, in my engine, 10W40 Penn's oil, with the gearbox additives, but without the anti-friction compounds that would mess up the clutch. Well, Penn's oil stopped making 10W40. 
they went, they went instead to 20W50 uh, because no motorcyclist in his right mind operates at sub-zero temperatures, and most motorcyclists operate a lot on hot days in the summer. Right around, right around the same time, time that I could no longer, longer get the right grade of Pennzoil, Rotax, in partnership with Shell Oil, came out with their own oil. It's called Aeroshell Sport Plus 4. It has the gearbox additives. It's, it's a semi-synthetic blended oil. It is 10W40 in viscosity range. It's perfect for this engine. It's a little more expensive, but I figure oil is cheap compared to engines. So that's the oil that Rotax recommends for break-in and operation. Oh, ah, wonderful. Hey, Jason, hey, Jason is wondering, um, how do the CV carbs prevent partial throttle when subjected to G-load? Oh, uh, well, the carburetors actually have a return spring, a very strong, strong spring on the throttle linkage built into the carburetor. These are... Uh, being 64 carburetors straight off a BMW motorcycle. They had a lot of history of them before they started putting them on aircraft engines. Uh, Chris is wondering, uh, she says, student pilot with two questions. What would be the replacement cost for swapping this out in a Cessna 150 question? Also, how do you handle the low availability of MoGas at airports? Uh, the first, one, the first one is I don't think uh, I don't believe that there's an STC to put a Rotax in a Cessna 150, so I don't think that's an option since it's a certificated airplane. This is correct. To my knowledge, there's no way you're going to put this engine into a certificated aircraft that was not designed originally for a Rotax engine. Uh, with regard to the second problem of uh, MoGas on the airports, those who do insist on using MoGas basically cart it in. They just take uh, five-gallon cans in the back of their car and they drive them to the airport. Many of us, on the other hand, have opted to go with 100 low lead and simply double up on our oil changes and filter changes. Teresa is wondering, uh, she says, I've been told to rev up the engine RPMs for a minute just before shutdown to prevent the spark plugs from fouling. This is opposite of your advice to cool the engine at idle prior to shutdown. Can you comment on this? Mike, you want to take that? Well, if, if, if I'm not mistaken, this this whole notion of revving up the engine before shutdown came from some a very old pamphlet that Lycoming issued a, a zillion years ago. Um, as far as I've been able to tell, there's absolutely no technical basis for it. Uh, in, in, in my view, revving up the engine before shutdown is usually a very rude thing to do, especially if you're on a tie down somewhere. Um, and, and as far as I can tell, it doesn't have any beneficial effect. So uh, I would, I, I tend to discourage people from, from doing that, although I've seen a lot of people do it. it you know, it's one of these things that you know, you know, sort of gets perpetuated, gets perpetuated from generation, generation of flight instructor to generation of flight instructor. Nobody really questions the, the, the reason why. They just, they're taught to do it that way, and they just teach to do it that way. I, 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 I don't think it's a good idea. I don't know, Paul, do you have any a different perspective on it? No, Mike, I think you said it right. Uh, however, I would like to respond to the other half of the question, which was about spark plug fouling. Uh, the, the best, best prevent prevention for spark plug fouling, fouling of course, is to change spark plugs early and often. But that, but that gets, gets really expensive with massive electrode aviation spark plugs. Fortunately, Rotax engines use automotive spark plugs, NGKs. Uh, they are very easy to change, very inexpensive. And I, rather than cleaning and gapping spark plugs like I used to do with the old champion uh, REM 48 or 38Es, what I do with my Rotax engine, every 100 hours when I've got it opened up for an oil change, I pull the spark plugs, I throw all eight of them away, I put eight brand new ones in, gapped freshly, and it costs me uh, $25 for a set of eight spark plugs. That My time is worth more than that if I tried to gap them and clean them. For sure. For sure. Ralph, Ralph is wondering, what's the coolant? Is it, is it a water coolant, coolant mixture? mixture? 
There are, there are a couple of different options for the coolant. Uh, there are, well, these engines come from Austria with a, a ethanol glycol, ethylene glycol based water mixture uh, from BASF. That's a German company. And the BASF coolant is very much like a, an automotive antifreeze. Uh, it, must it must be mixed 50-50 because, because that is the point, the, the mixture at which you get the maximum boiling, boiling temperature. If you have, if you have more coolant, coolant, it boils at a lower temperature. And if you have more water, it also boils at a lower temperature. temperature. So your sweet so spot is 50-50. They, they also recommend that you use only distilled water because tap water has minerals in it that will promote corrosion inside those cooling jackets in the heads. So BASF is what it comes from, what it comes with from the factory. However, However, it's hard to get in the U.S. US. So, so if I get, if I get a, new, a new engine in, the first thing I do is I drain and flush out all the coolant, and I replace it with a U.S. available ethylene glycol uh, distilled water mix. I personally use Prestone DexCool. It's the same thing you find in GM products. It's available at the Advanced Auto Supply Store. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's an excellent, excellent coolant over the right, the right temperature, temperature ranges pressure and pressure ranges at which our system operates. operates. Um, the people, the people who operate, who operate uh, in the highest temperature environment, environment tend to use a waterless coolant called Evans. Evans, Evans coolant does handle the high temperatures really, really well, uh, but it has a problem. If you, if you add any water to it at all, it loses its ability to cool the engine. So if you're using Evans, not only must you not put in water, but you, but must, you be must be very careful, careful that when you, when you, change, you change from water-based water to waterless water coolant, you have to not only flush out your whole system, system but also eliminate, eliminate any moisture by running alcohol, alcohol through the lines to absorb, to absorb any water droplets, droplets that might still be there. Be there. The, other the other problem with Evans is if you land at, at an airport and you need to top up your coolant level, you can't, you can't just add water. You have, you have to have Evans, and it's usually not available at most airports. You have to carry it with you. Whereas, Whereas with my, with my deck school 50 50, if I need to add a little coolant and I'm away from home base, I can add some distilled water. It's 89 cents a gallon at any, at any uh, grocery store. And it'll keep, if I only add a little bit, it's not going to upset the mixture balance too severely. So I can get home and then properly remix my coolant. Richard, Richard has a couple, couple comments here. here. Uh, first, Mike, talk, talk about how clearances inside the engine are so much tighter than lycosores. <laughs> a Rotax piston can be fitted size on signs and is worn out at 16 thousandths of wear. Also, also crankshafts are pressed together of five parts and must be inspected more carefully if there is a prop strike. Uh, may, uh, I may I handle the prop strike portion of that first, Mike? Sure, I was going to ask you to handle the prop strike portion of it. <laughs> okay, let me jump in and I'll turn it back to you. Uh, if in the case of a direct drive engine, if there is a prop strike, there's going to be an engine teardown. It's pretty much inevitable. With a geared engine with an overload clutch in the gearbox, if there happens to be a prop strike, the first thing you have to do is do a gearbox inspection. And if, if the gearbox is undamaged, is undamaged and, and the, uh, the, clutch the clutch has done its job cor correctly, correctly, the overload clutch has kind of kind released, released things so that you don't get twisting in the crankshaft, all you, all you may have to do at worst is, is a little bit of gearbox maintenance, put the gearbox, put the gearbox back on and fly the airplane. Now, now I do, I do an additional step in the event of a gearbox. gearbox. In the, in the event of a prop strike, strike. after having the gearbox check, checked, I like, I like to do a run out check, check with a dial indicator on the end of the crankshaft. And if that, and if that doesn't show uh, any, any distortion in the run out check, check, then the crankshaft, then the crankshaft is okay and I, and I can go from, from there. there. Now, there is a way of checking for crankshaft twist, twist but, but I've frankly, frankly never seen, seen it because the gearboxes are wonderful of taking a bullet for the engine. Paul, a clarification. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with how, how one does a run out check uh, on a propeller flange, but how do you do a run out check on a on the crankshaft of a geared engine? How do you get access to do that? Well, you're going to pull the gearbox anyway to inspect it. So while the gearbox is off, you've got access to the end of the crankshaft. Ah, uh, so okay, so that's where you, that's where you take the measurement. Okay, that 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 clarifies it. Thanks. Uh, 
Um, the, um, the other, other question had to do with the fact that the, the, the piston to cylinder clearance in a Rotax is, is a lot tighter than it is in, in, in Lyco Contasaurus. Um, and the, 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 there's really two issues there. First, first of all, the, 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 the Rotax cylinders are, are, are much, much smaller. So, so everything, everything scales, scales down proportionately, proportionately. But, the but the other consideration, consideration is that in, 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 in liquid-cooled liquid engines, um, temperature, temperature control is, is, is held much tighter. The range over the temperature range over which the components operate is, is, is a much narrower range. So we have, you know, far, far less uh, change in, in, in clearances as the engine warms up and cools down than we would in in a, in a continental Lycoming, Lycoming engine, which are purely, purely uh, air-cooled, air -cooled, which have much higher operating temperatures in the cylinder, in the cylinder components, components and, and which have much larger bores. bores. Um, so, so, I mean, that, the, all of those three considerations, considerations I think, combine uh, to, allow to allow an engine that that, that, that much tighter in its clearances, much, much the way um, automotive, automotive engines are much, much tighter in clearances than, uh, than Continental's and Lycoming's are. What additional, what additional consideration might be that in the Rotax engine, engine the cylinder and, and the piston are made, are made out of the same alloy, alloy. so we don't, so we don't have, have differential expansion and contraction in them like we might have in a continental or Lycoming. Ah, good point. Uh, Paul is asking, what are the comparative prices for Rotax engines? Aren't they expensive? Uh, last 912 ULS, uh, I had to price out, came in uh, at 19,000 new in the crate. But as, but as as I recall, Paul, the the the, the S engine is 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 several thousand dollars more expensive, even though it's virtually the same engine. That's that's right. If you're fly, flying an aircraft that requires a certified engine, you're going to be spending more because someone has to pay for the liability and someone has to provide income for the legal professionals who will be engaged if there's a, an incident. Right. Ooh, a little I, sarcasm I, I, there. None at, None at all. I don't. I don't have a <laughs> price list for Lycoming and Continental in front of me, but I suspect that twenty thousand dollar ish price point point is probably pretty similar to what Lycoming and Continental charge for their engines. I bet you're right on that. I bet a brand new engine in this class, hundred horsepower, is is very similar in pricing. I know, I know that I put aside ten dollars per flight hour toward the new engine uh, because I do observe TBO being in commercial operation, even though it's perfectly legal to run an engine on condition. Mm -hmm. Eric's wondering what is the cost of an overhaul? In my experience, it's not worth the small amount of savings. Might as well just buy yourself a brand new engine and a true zero time engine. At least, at least with the Rotax, that seems to be my experience. Mm -hmm. I wonder, what I wonder what they, they do with with, uh, with, an, with old an old engine then that you trade in. What, in. what happens to that 2,000-hour engine if it doesn't pay to overhaul it? Well, you send it back to Rotax and you get a couple of thousand-dollar core exchange, and then they tear it down and reuse some of the parts. Richard is commenting here. He said one drawback of the Rotax is that the prop will not windmill during an engine out. This is, this is true. You're going to have more drag in your glide. So if you have a true engine failure in flight, you plan on not having the 10 to 1 lift to drag ratio you were expecting. It may be 8 to 1, and you have to just land a little closer. Now, you don't have to glide quite as far to the scene of the accident, however. Okay, I'm okay, I'm confused by this, Paul. You need to explain this one to me like I'm a two-year-old. Because my, sure. my understanding is that a windmilling prop is much more draggy than a stop prop. So what are we talking about here? Um, I was expecting the other. If I'm mistaken, then please correct me. Um, I, I I know that we've done we've done we've done glide tests on single engine aircraft where the the propeller, the propeller was the, the the engine was the, the aircraft was pulled up in order to actually stop the propeller and we measured glide ratios and I'm sure that 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 a a stationary, a stationary propeller is less draggy than a windmilling prop. Windmilling, windmilling, windmilling prop has effectively the 
the the drag of the disc equivalent of that of that prop. Um, uh, this, 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 this sounds this sounds, sounds like we need to get a, a, an aeronautical engineer here on the Q and A session to go a little deeper into this. But I'm I'm pretty sure that that uh, that if the propeller stops, it actually decreases drag compared with windmilling. I know, I know that's certainly true for a stopped prop that is feathered, but for a non-featherable prop or, or for a fixed pitch prop, uh, I'm, I'm not certain. Uh, I do know that the one issue people well, we'll, have. Why don't we? Why don't we? We just leave it that we'll 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 bet a steak dinner on that, and and we'll we'll try to come up with an answer after class. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> Jason's wondering any thoughts on using iridium automotive spark plugs. Well, Rotax specifies uh, DCPR8E plugs for the 912 ULS and 912 IS engine. Uh, I, I know they must have had a reason for specifying that particular plug. Uh, since I'm changing them at 100 hours anyway because I'm running leaded fuel and I don't want to have issues with, with lead fouling, uh, I'd rather use the, the $2.5 plug than the $5 plug if I can. Yeah. yeah. Chris, is Chris is asking, how do you find a good, competent Rotax mechanic when something goes wrong? Rotax-owner.com is one place to find a list of all the mechanics who have taken the and are current in their Rotax factory training. There are Rotax authorized uh, independent repair centers scattered around the country, and I would start by looking online and finding somebody who is certified by the factory. Now, that said, fair disclaimer here, I am a Rotax authorized mechanic, so of course I have some self-interest in saying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we're, hey, we're reaching about the end, the end here, guys. Um, what, about what about this Rotax, Rotax training now? now? Is that, is that um, you, mentioned you mentioned that you go back to Rotax, Rotax training? Is that, is that uh, an, a recurring type training, training that uh, the te technicians get for Rotax? Get for Rotax? Well, at my, well, at my level, level, it is. Uh, for, uh, for the individual owner who just wants to take the Rotax service level course, course it's a weekend course. Anyone, anyone can take that. If you own a Rotax plane, I had to recommend it. And you're not looking for certification. You're just looking for taking care of your own aircraft so you don't have to worry about renewals. Uh, for anybody who goes to the maintenance level training or the heavy maintenance level training that I take, renewals are required. There is, a, there is a renewal course offered every two years uh, for my service level and maintenance level ratings. The heavy maintenance course, they do not have a renewal course. Rather, they require every two years that their authorized heavy maintenance personnel retake the heavy maintenance course every couple of years. And the reason is things are changing so much, you have to keep up with the latest and greatest. And it's a three-day course. Ah, cool. Well, this has been a wonderful... When, when when Paul says required, required uh, that that's not, that's not required, required by regulation, but, but it's presumably required, required by Rotex, by Rotex if, you if you want to be an approved service center. center. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, uh, great information. Hey, this has been a really interesting Q and A session uh, between the two of you, Paul and uh, Mike. And Paul, uh, Shuck, thank you so much for joining in tonight during this Q and A session, bringing your uh, experience operating this 912 engine uh, to the Q and A session. Uh, Mike, please take a moment and uh, share your closing comments. Well, my, my thanks to Paul too. Um, I, I was. I told, I told Tim, Tim prior, to prior to the beginning of this webinar, webinar I sure hope, hope Paul shows up, and I sure hope, sure hope you can hand him a microphone because that would be very helpful here. here. He's got a lot, a lot more experience, experience with these engines than I do, so thanks very much, much Paul. Paul. Um, as, as usual, I'd like to, like encourage, to encourage everybody, everybody if you haven't, you haven't already done so, to sign up for my free monthly newsletter. You can either do it by going to the SavvyAviation.com website, and there's a sign up for the newsletter thing up at the top of the screen, or during the post-webinar survey that Tim's going to put up right after we get done here tonight, there's a checkbox you can check, and if you do so, we'll add you to the to the mailing list. Uh, we've, we've been sending out a lot of very unusual stuff to our mailing list this last month in addition to the monthly newsletter. We've had um, very timely uh, bulletins about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Continental Camshaft Gear Mandatory Service Bulletin that very nearly became an AD until we managed to talk the FAA out of it. And, and the, the Lycoming, Lycoming um, 
mandatory, mandatory service bullet bulletin that, that becomes, becomes an AED, AED tomorrow, tomorrow uh, uh, much, much to the chagrin of, of, of uh, 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 quite, a quite a number of Lycoming owners that got stuck, stuck with connecting, connecting rods, rods with defective bushings in there. So in addition to the monthly newsletter, when we have something really Newsworthy, newsworthy for, for aircraft, aircraft owners, owners uh, those, the, those you, you, you'll, you'll receive that too if you put yourself on the list. Um, um, my book manifesto, manifesto uh, has been available on Amazon, Amazon since uh, since, uh, since, since it was published in 2014. Um, and uh, I would, if you're if you're interested in learning learning more about my overall maintenance philosophy, it's uh, that, that, that's, a good, that's a good place to start. To start. I'm, working I'm working on, on my, uh, second book my second book on piston aircraft, aircraft engines um, uh, as, we uh, as we speak, um, targeting, targeting uh, publication, publication in, in the spring, um, uh, certainly, uh, certainly before AirVenture Air 2018. That this is, this is we're, we're, we're working on this right, right now, and it's going to be a, a, quite a large book. It's going to be 350, 400 pages long. long. Um, um, and if you're interested in, in uh, getting more involved, more involved in my in my writing, writing efforts and and participating, participating in the review of the manuscripts, manuscripts and so on, and so on um, uh, uh, you can have an opportunity, an opportunity to do that by going to my Patreon site at patreoncom savvy aviator. And finally, and finally um, the, the, next the next few webinars, webinars that I'm going to be doing these are the first Wednesday of of each month. Uh, in, uh, September, in September, uh, the, the webinar, webinar is entitled Maintenance, Maintenance by the Book, book question mark, and it discusses the, the, um, the, regulations, the regulations that govern uh, mechanics, uh, mechanics and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, determine and, and indicate whether or not they are required, they are required to perform maintenance exactly, exactly the way the manufacturer specifies in the maintenance manual or what kind of latitude they have. They have to depart from from that from that guidance, guidance. and it's pretty interesting. Uh, it's the the answer to that question is uh, not well understood, um, uh, especially by by most mechanics. So it should be it should be an interesting session. Um, Wednesday, October fourth, um, and uh, this is slightly speculative, but. Yeah, in on September, um, um, I think it's twelfth and thirteenth. I'm going, to I'm going to be participating in the second annual General Aviation Engine Summit meeting with the FAA up at uh, what used to be the Engine and Propeller Directorate up in uh, uh, Burlington, Massachusetts. They they just had a big regional organization. They're not called the Engine and Propeller Directorate anymore. They they're, they're they're called some very complicated phrase that I that I haven't committed to memory yet. But um, we're going to be meeting. A bunch, of a bunch of us are going to be meeting with the FAA. FAA. This is a summit meeting that involves um, uh, alphabet groups representing aircraft owners, um, the engine manufacturers, um, various other industry participants, and a whole lot of folks from various parts of the FAA where we're going to be talking about um, uh, general, aviation general aviation aircraft engines and uh, probably, uh, probably talking, talking a lot about, about airworthiness directives, directives and generally, generally how we, how, how the, the FAA does business with manufacturers and, and aircraft owners when it comes to, uh, 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 to safety issues. Um, so um, that, should that should be kind of interesting, and I'm hoping to prepare a, a report on that and, and, uh, and go over what occurred at the, at the engine summit, summit in my uh, October, October webinar. Uh, in November, uh, in November um, I'm, I'm thinking, thinking about doing, doing unless unless Tim vetoes, vetoes this, this, I'm thinking, thinking about doing something a little bit uh, different different than what I usually do because most of the most, most of my webinars are, are maintenance uh, related. But I was going to do a, um, a webinar, webinar on single pilot IFR and uh, uh, go over some of the interesting statistics. Uh, about, uh, about why single, single pilot, pilot uh, pilots, pilots who fly single pilot, pilot IFR get in trouble, get in trouble and talk about some of the things that we can do in terms, in terms of, of, uh, of, cockpit of cockpit discipline and so on, and so on to, to minimize, to minimize the, the risk when flying single pilot, pilot IFR. Um, um, and uh, Tim, that's, Tim all that's all I've got. Oh, oh great, Mike. I, I look forward to your uh, November 1st single pilot IFR webinar. I think that'll be very interesting. I'm, I'm happy to see you do that. Thank you for, for doing that.
Great job, Great job as, as always, always, Mike. Uh, thanks, for uh, thanks for volunteering your time. Your time. Uh, uh, Paul Schuck, Schuck uh, thank you so much for being on board with us tonight, volunteering your time, being a part of the discussion. And to everybody who tuned in, we had over 400 at one point. Thank you all so much for tuning in and have a wonderful evening. And we'll see you all next week. Remember, we have a Tuesday night and Wednesday night webinar, both of them uh, looking real good in my opinion. So hope you can join us. Have a great night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming.